When we're designing robotic systems, it helps if we have a common language that we can use to describe our robot. There might be many different software components that all need to know about the physical characteristics of the robot. So for simplicity and consistency, it helps if we can keep this information in one location where all of the code can reference it. In ROS, we call this the robot description. And this information is stored in a format called URDF, which stands for Unified Robot Description Format. We encountered URDF files briefly in the last tutorial, but this time we're going to dig a bit deeper and learn how we can use them to describe our own robot. Now, when you open up a URDF file, it can be pretty scary. It's really long and full of all these words and symbols and that sort of thing. But if we take a moment to look more closely and break it down, we'll see that it's actually made up of a whole bunch of simple structures repeated over and over again. So in this video, we're going to step through those structures to understand them, and then we're going to look at an example URDF file, break it down and see what it's doing. Also, if you just came from the last video, I know I said we were going to be doing simulations this time, but as I started on that, I realized that UIDF was going to take up a whole video on its own. So watch this one, and then next time, I promise, we'll be learning how to do simulations in Gazebo. So let's get started. So let's say we've got a robot and we want to describe it using UIDF. The first step is to break the physical structure down into separate components, which we call links. There's a fair bit of freedom here, but if we're having trouble figuring out what our links should be, there are two things to keep in mind. Firstly, if two parts can move independently of each other, then they're going to need to be separate links. Secondly, if it just makes sense for two parts to be separated, maybe we've got a sensor or some other module that could be removed, then it should probably be a separate link. We get to choose where the origin for the link's coordinate system is, and it doesn't matter too much where we put it, except for rotating links, which should have their origin at the pivot point. So here we might have a link for the base, one for the little block, which I'll call slider, one for the arm, and then finally, one for the camera at the end of the arm. Then we need to understand how the links are joined together, how they relate to each other. These connections between links are called joints, and more specifically, the joints define the relationship between the origins or the coordinate frames of the links. And this effectively determines the position and also the rotation of each link in space. Each link apart from the first one will have a corresponding joint that says what other link it was connected to, its parent, and how it's connected to the parent. Each link can only have one parent, but it can have many child links, each of which will have their own joints defining their position. So here we would have a joint from the base to the slider, one from the slider to the arm, and one from the arm to the camera. When we're describing a joint, we also have to specify what type of motion it uses. There are a bunch to choose from, but there are four common types that will cover most use cases. First up is Revolute. So this is rotational motion about a point with a fixed start and stop angle, so fixed limits. Uh, you can think of something like a robotic arm. Secondly is Continuous. So this is also rotational motion about a point but this is where there's no fixed limits. Uh, it can spin freely forever. So you might think of something like a wheel or maybe a spinning gripper at the end of an arm that can rotate continuously. Thirdly is prismatic. So this is a linear translational motion. Um, so something like a linear actuator that uh, moves along a rod. And fourthly is fixed. So this is where the child link doesn't move relative to the parent link. And we use these for those kind of links where we uh, are just making one for convenience because it, it makes more sense to keep things separated. So there are a few other joint types out there that you can choose from, but these four will cover you for almost all scenarios. Now this might all sound pretty confusing, but we're going to dive into the UIDF format and hopefully as we go you'll start to understand and then at the end we'll look at an example. UIDF is based on XML. So everything is represented as a series of tags that are nested inside each other. A proper XML file first has to start with an XML declaration, and then after that it has one tag called the root tag, and every other tag lives inside that. For UIDF, that root tag is called the robot tag, and we don't do too much interesting with it. All it has is one attribute, and that's the name. So we use that to specify the name of our robot. And so all of our other tags are going to go inside the robot tag, and typically that's going to be link tags and joint tags. So each link tag will represent one link. We need to give it a name, but we also have the option to specify three additional characteristics, the visual, collision, and inertial properties. Now these are generally optional, but in some situations one or more of them might be required, especially when we do simulations. 
So let's take a look at these. First up, visual. This is what we see in RViz and Gazebo, and there are three aspects to this that we can specify. Firstly, there's the geometry. This is the overall shape. We can make it a box, a cylinder, or a sphere with parameters we can adjust, or we can specify a path to a 3D mesh. Then we've got the origin. So this is an offset for the geometry so that it doesn't have to be centered around the link's origin. And thirdly is the material. This is basically just the color. We can enter the color as an RGB triplet, or if we'd already set up a material earlier, as we'll see later, uh, we can just reference the name of the material. Just so you know, this will only set the color in RViz, not Gazebo. We'll talk more about that in the next tutorial. And we can actually specify multiple visual tags for a link if we want, and that way we can form more complex sh shapes. Next up is collision. This is used for the physics collision calculations. Again, we can set the geometry and the origin, just like with the visual tag. This will often be copy and pasted straight from the visual tag, but sometimes we, we might want to use a simpler collision geometry. Uh, for example, we might have a complex mesh visually, but we want to just use a box for collision for computational purposes. And so like the visual tag, we can have multiple collision tags to build up more complex objects. Finally, we've got the inertial tag. This is also used in the physics calculations, but this is about how the link responds to forces. The inertial properties are the mass of the link, the origin, so this is the center of mass or the center of gravity. Um, this is the point that the link could balance on, which is a bit of a confusing concept in 3D. Um, for most simple cases, this is just gonna be the center, the same as the visual and the collision origin. And then finally, inertia. This is the rotational inertia matrix and is probably the most confusing part of this section if you haven't come across it before. This describes how the distribution of mass affects rotation of the link. Wikipedia has a good list of the inertia matrices or tensors for common shapes, and we can get a pretty accurate simulation just by approximating our links as prisms, ellipsoids, or cylinders. Uh, a rough guess will usually be fine. And remember, the inertia tag is for the inertia matrix, which lives inside the inertial tag, which specifies all the inertial properties together. Now at the end of the video, we're gonna see all three of these in action together on the example robot. And we'll also see a trick to make doing the inertia matrix calculations much easier. Although we primarily think of the robot in terms of links, it's actually the joints that are where all the detail is at in terms of the robot structure. This is because it's the joints that actually define where the links are in space. This is kind of like in the last tutorial where we looked at transforms. Although we're interacting with the frames, it's the transforms themselves that define where the frames are in space. And so it's most important that we get them right. Each joint will need to have the following specified. A name, uh, it's always good to name your joints. Some circumstances you don't have to, but it's good to just name them all the time. Uh, the type, so that's what we talked about before. Um, fixed, prismatic, revolute, continuous. Parent and child links. So that's which links this joint defines a relationship between. So this joint is effectively defining the location of the child link with respect to the parent link. And finally, the origin. So this is the relationship between the two links before any motion is applied. Now that's good enough for a fixed joint, but for a non-fixed joint, we're gonna to need to specify a couple of extra characteristics. There are a few that we can do, but the two that we pretty much always need are the axis and the limits. So the axis determines uh, which axis the joint moves along or around. So that could be X or Y or Z or some combination of them. And the limits determine the physical limitations of the joint. Um, so those are the upper and lower position limits in radians or in meters the velocity limits in radians per second or meters per second, and the effort limits. So that'll be in newtons or in newton meters. Again, if this all sounds a bit complicated, we'll be working through an example at the end of the video and hopefully that'll make everything clear. So far we've seen the robot tag, the link tag, and the joint tag. And these are the main things that you're gonna see in every UIDF. However, the way that UIDF is designed is that there are a few other tags and you can also add your own and certain nodes might be expecting certain other tags to exist. Um, depending on how you've got it set up. Some of the other tags that you'll pretty often see in a UIDF are a material tag. So this lets us uh, name a color so that we can reuse it multiple times. You can see a gazebo tag. So when we're doing simulations, we can specify a couple of extra parameters for how we want the simulation to work. And transmission tags, these define how an actuator is connected to a joint. Um, so there are these and other tags out there that you might come across every so often. Another thing that's worth chatting about is naming conventions. 
As we said, we need to name all of our links, and it's also good to name all of our joints too. It's worth where we can trying to follow some conventions as we do this. Uh, there are certain ROS naming conventions for mobile platforms and humanoid platforms and that sort of thing. Um, however, it's worth even just having your own little conventions to keep things consistent. For example, you might have the, the suffix underscore link on every link that you do, and then the suffix underscore joint on every joint that goes with that link. So you have the arm link and the arm joint, and the wrist link and the wrist joint. And by doing this, it just means that when you're working on the project or if someone else is looking at your URDF, it's much easier to figure out what's going on and to understand how the robot works. Before we look at an example of a URDF file, it's worth learning about a tool that ROS provides to make them easier to work with, and that's called Xacro, or maybe Zacro, I don't know. It's short for XML Macro. And it's a tool that lets us take URDF files and do a lot more things with them. Uh, there are a bunch of things it can do, but the two that we're going to look at today are using Zacro to split up files into multiple files and to uh, avoid repeating ourselves. When we write UADF files, there's often a lot of things that we have to repeat over and over again, and Zacro gives us some tools to avoid doing that. To enable the use of Zacro in our files, all we need to do is add this little extra bit to our robot tags that you can see up there now. It's good to just put this into every robot tag in every UIDF file that you do. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have it there, and it means that we always have the option of using Xacro if we need it. Then basically, whenever we need to use our UIDF file, we need to run the Xacro program on it first. That'll take the file or multiple files if we've split it up, and it'll process through them, figuring out anything it needs to do, and spit out a single complete UIDF into memory. What we'd normally do is then feed that result straight into Robot State Publisher, which then publishes the complete UIDF on the robot description topic. And that way, any node that needs it can see it. Uh, we usually use a launch file to do all of this. So we would read the UIDF files, pass them into Xacro, pass it into Robot State Publisher, which then puts it on the, on the topic. And so we can then write that launch file once and just reuse it in as many projects as we want. Being able to split our URDF up into multiple files is really useful because otherwise they become very big and unwieldy. Separating components out makes it easier to find things that we're looking for, to change them, it makes it easier to share bits between different projects, and to use version control software like Git to quickly see what's been changed. How we split up a UIDF is going to depend a little bit on the individual developer and the project that they're working on. For example, we might want to split up the core structure of the robot into one file, the materials that we're using into a file, the sensors that we're using into a file, and the macros that we're using into a file. We'll learn more about them in a minute. But you can really split it up however you like. So how does it work? To start off with, we'll have one main file that represents the robot. And as usual, this robot tag has its name, as well as the little exacro bit that we saw just before. Now inside this file, we can include another file. And it'll be sort of like all the tags that are in the included file are copied and pasted into the main file. So to include another file, all we've got to do is put that include tag. Now for this to work, the included file has to be a bit special too. Like the main file, it will also have a robot tag, usually with the Xacro bit, but we don't need to specify a name this time if we don't want to. Then we can put whatever tags that we want to include inside that robot tag. Uh, sometimes we might want to give this robot a name, and that way we can treat it as a robot of its own. It'll sort of depend on your situation. Then we can include as many of these URDF Xacro files as we want, either nesting them or in series, and we can mix and match the includes as well as normal tags. Uh, we usually give the main URDF file the extension .urdf.exacro, but the included ones tend to vary a bit. Sometimes we just use .exacro, sometimes they'll also be .urdf.exacro, some people will have their own extensions that they want to use. The other thing Xacro helps us to do is avoid repeating code. There's a principle in programming called DRY, which stands for don't repeat yourself. And that means that anywhere that we can, we want to avoid having the same information or the same procedure repeated multiple times. There's a few reasons we want to do this. The more times you've got to write it, the more chances you have of doing it wrong. And then when you want to go and change something, you have to go and check all the spots to make sure you change it. And then if you miss one, you can end up with really hard to find bugs because there are two things that are doing almost the same thing, but slightly different. There are a whole lot of ways that Xacro can help us simplify our UIDF files and avoid repeating ourselves and avoid making mistakes. Some of the most common ones are properties, so we can declare a property to be equal to some value and then reference it by name later on. Mathematical operators, so we can perform operations and use mathematical constants within our attributes. 
and macros, which are basically like a template for a tag that can take parameters in and then we can reuse that template over and over in different places. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff that we've covered so far. What we're gonna do now is dig into an example and we're gonna see each of these things in action and hopefully get a bit of a better understanding for how they work. Okay, so here's an example of a fairly simple robot and we're gonna step through the URDF for it. So this has got a bunch of joints and there are two that move. So we've got a prismatic joint that can slide along the base. And then we've got a revolute joint on this arm. And you can kind of imagine that we've got a camera at the end of this arm. So maybe this is for some remote filming system. I don't know. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enable TF and I'm actually gonna drop the alpha of the model down a little bit so that we can see the uh, link origins inside each one. And so we can see for this one, we've got five links, the world, the base, the slider, the arm, and the camera. And then there are four joints that are between these. So we've got a joint from world to base, from base to slider, from slider to arm, and from arm to camera. So let's step through these. So start of our file, we can see we've got our XML, de de our XML declaration, We've got our robot tag with the Xacro namespace and we also specify the name of our robot called robot, very original. Now the first thing we've got here is an Xacro include and we can see it's including a file called example include.exacro. So let's have a look at what's in there. Again, it's got the start tags and then we've got three materials. So we're specifying white, orange and blue. And then we also specify some macros. Now we're gonna get into these macros a bit later, so we won't worry about them just now. So go back to here. So the contents of that, we can imagine getting copied and pasted to here. And then we have our first link, and that link is called world, and that's empty because it kind of just represents an, an anchor point for the world. There's no visual thing to go with it. Now, the next link is gonna be our base link. And so we need a base joint for it. So the base joint goes from world to base link. And you can see it's 1.5 across in X and one forward in Y. So if we look at this from the top, we go from world 1.5 across and one forward. And we can see the base link there. So if we do that, we can see the base link is also at, at Z0. So that's the base joint. Now let's look at the base link. So we've got a visual tag, which specifies an origin. Now the only thing we've got here is we've gone Z.05. And the point of that is that if this was centered around the base link, then the, uh, the visual component would be sitting in the ground. And so our box is, has a thickness of 0.1 meters in Z. And so we need to raise it up by half of that in order for the box to kind of sit flush with the ground. So we've got our box that's 2.5 meters long, 1.5 meters wide and 0.1 meter high. And you notice here we're specifying the material manually. We still need to enter a name for it, um, but we're, we're specifying a color. And so I've picked this green color here. And then we've got the collision, which is exactly the same as the visual, just without a material. And then finally the inertia. Um, you can see it's got the same origin. I've set a mass. And then we've got these inertial parameters, which I've calculated myself uh, based on the, uh, the matrices that you can find online. Um, so that's the, the inertial matrix for a rectangular prism with mass 12. Next up is gonna be the slider joint. So this is the joint from the base link to the slider link. Now this joint is prismatic. So that means it's linear motion now we can see here the origin is minus 1.25 in X and 0.1 in Z. So that's saying that when we have this at zero from the base link, we're going up 0.1. So that was the thickness of our plate. And then we're going back minus 1.25. So that's the, the, the length of our plate. So that when we're at zero, this is located there. Uh, then the parent link is the base link, the child link is the slider link. Now the axis here is one in X. 
So that means that when this moves, it'll move along the x-axis. We've got a lower limit of zero, so that's where we're starting, and an upper limit of two, so this should move a total of two meters. Then for now, for velocity and effort, I've just put large numbers in there. We're not worrying about them for the moment. They just need to be there. And so you can see, to start off with, this is sitting on that grid line. And then when we move it two meters, you can see it now sits on that grid line. Sometimes you'll find the transparency goes a bit funny with, with Arbiz. So we can adjust that joint state and that will move the joint. So then slider link, what have we got here? We've got the same sort of thing that we did with the box where we shift it up by half of the thickness of the box. Uh, now this time, we've just said material name is blue. We haven't specified a color. And that's because we defined a material called blue back here in our included file. And so we could then include this in a different robot and also use blue in that robot. Um, so we've got that, we've got the collision box, which is just, again, copied and pasted from the visual. And now let's have a look at the inertial. Here for the inertial parameters, in this one, we had to specify everything. So we specify the origin, the mass, and then each of these little elements of the inertia matrix. For this one, we've used Xacro inertial box. And all we did was specify a mass, the X, Y, and Z lengths. So these are exactly the same as what we used here in the visual and the collision tags. And then we put the origin in here. And what this does is it's gonna use this inertial box macro here and says, okay, we specified the mass, X, Y, Z, and then we put an origin tag in it. So it'll take that origin tag, it'll put it in there, and then it'll take those mass and X and Y and Z values and do all the calculations that it needs to spit out the full inertial block that you would use for a box. And so that saves us having to do all that math ourselves. So that's the slider link. Uh, now the next joint is the one that goes from slider link to arm link. So that one's called arm joint. It's a revolute joint. Um, now the only really new thing here, or well, we've got a couple of new things. For one, you notice that the axis here is minus one in the Y. Uh, that's because if we look at, at this joint, if we were to rotate uh, anti-clockwise around this joint, that would be positive and that would be pushing it down. Whereas I want a positive state value to be up. So that means we're actually rotating around the minus Y axis. So a positive rotation around the minus Y axis will lift our joint up. The other thing we're doing here is I've set the upper limit to 90 degrees, but it wants to be in radians. And so we're using the mathematical feature of Xacro to do pi on two. And that way, when we put that to max, it should be straight up in the air. So that's the arm joint. Next up is the arm link, which is this orange cylinder here. Again, we've got a few new things here. So firstly, we're using properties. So I've declared a property called arm length, which is the length of this arm and arm radius. Now this way, instead of before, we actually had the same values repeated over and over. You can see VS Code's even highlighted them. Um, because we're just having to repeat it in the visual tag and the collision tag, and then sometimes even in the inertial tag. This way, what we can do is we can specify a property, and that way, if we need to change it, we can change them all at once. So for example, let's make this two meters long and 0.04 meters radius. And then if we rerun our joint state publisher, you'll see it'll reset the positions to zero, but we can see now our arm is longer and thinner and everything else has kind of moved to the correct location to match it. One other thing we've done here that you might notice is that for the visual and collision and the inertial elements, we've rotated the cylinder by pi on two uh, in Y. And so that's because normally the cylinder is oriented in the Z direction, but we need it to be oriented along the X direction. So we've had to rotate it by pi on two, uh, positive pi on two, positive 90 degrees in Y, and that takes the Z-oriented cylinder and rotates it so it's oriented along X. So that's our arm link. Now our next link is going to be camera link, and the joint from the arm to the camera is going to be called camera joint. And so we can see that this one is a fixed 
link uh, joint, I mean. And so, uh, yeah, even though the camera um, isn't moving relative to the arm, we could just make these boxes all be part of the arm. Um, this way we could then uh, take this section and copy and paste it into a, a new project. We could put it into its own Xacro file. Um, we can kind of do its own thing and it will get its own transform in the transform tree. So it's useful to, to specify its own link. So, uh, yep, nothing special there. It's just a fixed joint um, at some set origin. And again, we're utilizing those properties there. And then finally, the camera link. So the special thing about this one is we've actually composed this of multiple objects. So we can see there are two visual tags. The first one is this box part. And then the second one is this cylindrical part and we've combined them together to make this kind of camera looking thing. Now for the collision, again, we could have just copied and pasted that, um, but instead what we've done is we've only got one collision and we've made that a box that would encompass all of it. So if you see here in RVs, we tick collision enabled and you can see the box that covers up the whole camera. Um, if I turn off the visual, it becomes a little bit clearer. So you can see uh, that might be a reason to use a slightly different collision mesh to what you're using for your visual mesh. Um, yep, the other thing to note here is just that we actually specified a different material for the box and the cylinder, but Arvis just looks at the first one and seems to use that for everything. I don't know uh, if that's deliberate or um, just a bug, but just be aware of that in case you do want to make it different colors. So yeah, that's it. That's our um, Xacro slash URDF example um, for a simple robot. I encourage you to go through, have a good look through that, try to understand the different things that are going on, um, and then you can go ahead and use that to design your own robots. Hopefully you found that helpful to understand URDF and how we can use it in the robot design process. Next time, as promised, we'll be looking at the Gazebo simulation software and how we can take that URDF and drop it into a simulation environment to see what happens. If you're keen to see that, uh, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out. Um, if you did find this helpful, please let us know in the comments or like the video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.